right, so can everyone hear me? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about sustainability. But there probably won't be any mention of the UBC farm, or recycling, or composting, or forks that are made out of corn. Because the truth is that sustainability means one thing at UBC, but it means something entirely different elsewhere. In fact, it's often referred to as a first world luxury. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what sustainability means in places where people are tied more closely to their land and where the choices are more difficult than whether or not to bring a reusable mug to Starbucks. So let's talk a little bit about what sustainability means outside of UBC. Now, I'm a solder student, but I'm studying economics and ecology, and so my main interest is in international development and how the natural world plays into that. Um, it means that I look at everything through an economics lens, and unfortunately for some of you today, it's not going to be any different. Uh, I would like to talk about three of my experiences as a student so far in solder, um, starting with the trip that I took this past summer on an internship to Indonesia. So I went with other students from the land and food systems faculty, and we worked at the Center for International Forestry Research, called C4. And for myself, I focused on the story behind this. It's a chair, but what's more important is that it's made out of rattan, which is similar to bamboo. Rattan itself grows like a vine-like structure, it, um, it can't support itself, so what it does is it wraps itself around existing trees. And Indonesia used to be a leading producer of rattan. So farmers and harvesters would come in, and they would go through these forests, and they would cut down the rattan when it got to a certain size. And after that, they would bundle it up and transport it down the rivers, where it was then sent to a processing center and made into furniture. However, there are changes in the landscape right now. And instead of choosing to continue producing rattan and keeping the forest intact to help it grow, many farmers are instead choosing to sell their land to mining companies or to turn it into an oil palm plantation. And the result of this means that in the process, you have to clear everything out of a forest. So trees, wildlife, bugs, everything is generally removed. And what happens is that after the mine is depleted, the land becomes relatively worthless. Or if you turn it into an oil palm plantation, you can see pollution that will affect water quality permanently. So why was this happening? Why were they choosing, instead of to keep the land as a forest and to make an income in this manner, why were they choosing to convert it into something else? And this made me think about a similar problem I'd seen in an ecology lecture I took with Professor Roy Turkington. And he traveled to an area in Tibet where he saw this happening. So what's going on in this image is that the village is actually turning their topsoil into bricks. Now, once you strip off the layer of topsoil, then the land becomes exponentially less productive. So it's harder to grow a lot of food on it. And at an altitude and a temperature like that of Tibet, we could see centuries before the topsoil can actually regenerate again. So why, why was, ha what was this happening? Uh, we, we didn't really know at that point. In my final example, I finished a research project last year on Haiti, a country that uh, we all know now because of the earthquake that uh, flattened the capital. But Haiti was having problems with deforestation long before this had happened. So if you look at an aerial image of uh, the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, you can see that there is a lot more green on one side than on the other. And that green is forest cover. And it's completely gone on the side that belongs to Haiti. In Haiti, in rural communities, uh, fuel and firewood is still a common source of, uh, for cooking. And also, uh, communities will often go into the forest and take timber and charcoal to sell. So what's happening is that they're depleting the forest at a fast enough rate that it actually can't regenerate. And then as this happens, they have to go further and further up the mountains in order to find more timber. So of course I look at all three cases and I wonder to myself, well, something must be going on. I mean, it, it seems all of these cases seem a little strange, so the answer must be in economics somewhere. So for a second, I want you to leave behind Haiti and Tibet and Indonesia, and we're going to go on a little vacation of the mind, and we're going to Vegas. <laughs> so you've just arrived in Vegas, and you've checked into your hotel, and we sit down at a slot machine, and when you uh, put in the first quarter, you have just hit the jackpot. Well, you, you got $10,000, so a small jackpot, so you congratulate yourself. Good job. Um, and as you go up to the cashier to collect your winnings, 
the lady at the counter tells you, you know, sir or ma'am, sorry, we're kind of, uh, we're short on uh, cash today, so we can't really uh, pay you. We were wondering if we can write you a post-dated check. Um, our finances will kind of be in order in sometime around 2020, so 10 years from now. And so you stand there and you think to yourself, well, that's kind of, that's really unacceptable because $10,000 now and $10,000 10 years from now is not the same thing at all. I mean, that's a lot of waiting, you know, and you want your money now. So you probably will ask for some level of compensation and how much compensation you stand there and you kind of mull it over. You know, are you going to ask for $100 more or $1,000 more or $2,000 more? What you're essentially doing at this point is you're evaluating your own discount rate. And your discount rate is how much you would have to be compensated in order to wait for something rather than to get it today. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but all you have to remember is that your discount rate is the relative value you place on now versus getting something tomorrow. And a higher discount rate means that you're going to be less patient. It means that you would really prefer to have something today. And that means that in the case of Vegas, you might demand a larger amount of compensation on your, pay, on your check. If you have a lower discount rate, it means that you're a little bit more patient and that the difference between today and tomorrow isn't as great. And what that means is that you might demand less compensation for your check or you would be willing to put up with less compensation. So going back to our three cases, we can see that Essentially, communities are faced with a problem of investing, and they look at it through their discount rates. There's two options for them, and option A is the later. Option A is something that might cost you up front, but later down the road might be better. So in our case, it might be not producing uh, bricks out of your topsoil, or it might be, I mean uh, keeping your forests intact to continue producing rattan. Or it could mean not choosing to harvest all the trees out of a particular area if you're in Haiti. But option B is the now. And option B is the one that pays you back immediately, but could cost you a lot later down the road. And in our case, option B would be something like choosing to make bricks out of your topsoil to sell for income, or choosing to turn all of the forest in a certain area into charcoal. Or it could mean choosing to sell your land to a mining company. But we can see that in the case in the cases we looked at, that the communities are generally choosing option B, and they're choosing it at a frantic pace. But option B is really costly later on. I mean, in, in Haiti and in Indonesia, deforestation is one of the most pressing problems of the coming century. So if they know that it's costing so much up front, uh, down the road, sorry, then, then why are they choosing to do it? Is there perhaps a link between poverty levels and your discount rate? And there's actually some evidence for this. So a study done by a university in Norway went into villages in Zambia, in Ethiopia, and in Indonesia. And they'd sit down with the head of a household and they'd ask them, we could give you a certain amount of corn today, or we could give you a certain amount of corn in a year from now. But how much corn would we have to give you in a year from now so that you'd be willing to wait that year? And when they collected the results, they found that in these communities, the discount rate was very, very high. In fact, it was in the range of 0.49 to 0.65. And what this means is that these communities wanted to be compensated with one and a half to two times the amount of corn if they were going to wait for a year. Now imagine for a second that if you, in Canada, you were dealing with a, a bank for your student loans that had a similar discount rate to this. So what would that mean? That would mean that whatever you borrowed today, you'd have to pay back double the amount in a year. If that was compo uh, compounded, that means you'd have to pay back about eight times that amount at the end of your degree. So all of a sudden, it's not looking like uh, an option that you'd be willing to choose. So we can see that our discount rate is much lower than in these communities, but why is it so? Why does poverty have any sort of relationship with your discount rate? And the first reason is that because being poor means that you have to think about your immediate survival needs. So it's easy to talk about sustainable forest management, but the truth is that if it meant that you weren't sure if your family was going to make it through next year, then you would think twice about conservation as well. And related to this idea is the fact that if you're in poverty, it means that you don't have a lot of cash, you don't have a lot of savings. 
And savings is important because it acts as a buffer in the case of an emergency. So that would be like a child that fell sick, or a bad harvest year, or if there was a natural disaster that took out your house. And so if you don't have savings up front, then it's easy to see why you would prefer any amount of income that you can get today to build up your savings in the case of these emergencies. In Canada, savings helps us think more long term as well. So for a second, I want you to imagine that you have just finished your secondary education, but you don't have an RESP, and you don't have access to scholarships, grants, bursaries, or anything else that can help you get through your, uh, your post-secondary education. Your parents can't contribute anything, and you didn't work a part-time job. All of a sudden, you have no savings, and you have to make this investment in going to university. But because you don't have anything saved up, you're not quite sure how you're going to be able to feed or shelter yourself for four years. And so all of a sudden, coming to UBC might not be an investment that you'd be willing to make. It's just you have a higher discount rate. And the way that loans help us is that, especially for students, they give us an artificial level of savings. And in doing so, they lower our initial discount rates. But in these communities, you might not have access to loans. And that's the third reason why they have higher discount rates. If you don't have a lot of stuff, and you don't have a lot of stuff that's valuable to other people, then it's more difficult for you to approach a bank and for them to be convinced to give you a loan. Because they have nothing that they can take if you're unable to pay them back. And so what you might do in this case is you might go to a village money lender. A money lender who would require you to pay back double, or triple, or four times the original amount of the loan. So you can see that if you're living in these communities, and you don't have a lot of cash, and you don't have savings, and your only option for a loan is something that's going to cost you a lot later down the road, it's easy to see why you would want any income that you can get today, rather than to wait for it. And all of a sudden, it becomes easy to see why you would prefer to make bricks out of your topsoil. So we can see that because you don't have a lot of savings, you don't have access to loans, and because you're thinking about your immediate survival needs, these communities are often faced with a higher discount rate. It's just part of the way that they look at the land. It's not worth the investment. And the problem with this, though, is that the land and natural systems often think in long terms. So forests operate in decades and centuries and even thousands of years. But unfortunately, that's just not the way that these communities are thinking in terms of their priorities. So what's going on now? Um, so there, is a, there are NGOs that are working in Indonesia. And one of them is Green Living. And what they're doing is they're raising the promise of future income from forests in line with the higher discount rates. And what Green Living has been doing is they go into communities and they help them secure government recognition of their rights, their legal title, to a section of forest. And once that title is secured, the community can then go in and harvest rattan and timber and other products at a rate that's low enough that allows the forest to regenerate. They then take these products, and what they do is they turn them into furniture, which Green Living Indonesia then helps to market abroad. So without the advocacy of NGOs like Green Living, it'd be harder for them to be promised any sort of future income. And it'd be harder for them to make an investment in their land. So forests, mangroves, and other natural systems are being lost all around the world. And it's important not only because we depend on them vitally in so many ways, but because a lot of us want our, our, kill, our kids and our, um, our grandchildren to grow up knowing what a rainforest looks like, what certain types of wildlife look like. But going into these areas and saying, and hoping that the government is going to put a fence around a piece of land and call it protected land and keep out people might not be the best solution. We need to think more in terms about what the community is going to be doing and how they view the land. And it's not enough anymore to think about conservation and sustainability and charge in with a singular goal. So we need to ask questions and make communities part of the equation. So what do they see in the land and how do they invest in it? What are the discounts rate like? Uh, do they have any choices? And how can we give them better choices? So it begins by examining our own assumptions and our own priorities and realizing that in order to talk about forests 
and talk about mangroves and talk about these systems, then we first need to talk to the people. So thanks for listening. <laughs>